Go in our Bibles now to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 21. Here the New Testament looks back at the cross and says this, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Some people camp out there and say, Christ was an example for us. Yes, he was, but he was much more than that. He was an example, absolutely, but he was much more than that. Verse 22, who committed no sin. There it is. He lived the perfect life. Nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And here it is, the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. And he himself, who? The Lord Jesus Christ, bore our sins. Where? In the Garden of Gethsemane? No. That's what the Mormons teach. No. He bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And now he quotes Isaiah again. For by His wounds, by His scourging, by His stripes, you were healed. How did He bear our sins? By imputation. God laid on the back of Christ all the sins of all those who would ever believe. And so God can now transfer the third transfer. Number one, Adam's sin to the human race. Number two, the sin of all God's people to Christ on the cross. Number three, the life, the righteousness of Christ to everyone who believes in Him. On what ground? The imputation of the righteousness of Christ alone. God declares of me and of anyone else who believes, of themselves they're a sinner. I see the sin. Luther had an expression in Latin, simul justus et peccator. Say it fast and you can be very authoritative. It's very good. Simul justus et peccator. What does it mean? At the same time. We have the word simultaneously. Simul. At the same time, just and sinner. Isn't that a contradiction? No, because it's in different senses. In one sense, I'm a sinner. And the moment I call upon the Lord, I'm still a sinner. And guess what? Eight seconds afterwards, I'm still a sinner. And 90 years afterwards, I'm still a sinner. This side of the grave and glorification, I will always have this sin nature. But the moment I put my faith in Jesus Christ, while a sinner, while ungodly, I look away from myself. I look away, see that my Redeemer has paid for my sins and will give me righteousness, His righteous life as a gift. God says, all right, I've transferred your sin to Christ 2,000 years ago, and 2,000 years ago, I credited your account with righteousness so that you can say with Abraham, I believe God, and God credited it to me as righteousness. Not by works, but by believing in Him who justifies the ungodly. At the same time, just and sinner. Yes, God wants to work on our lives. Yes, He wants us to be more Christ-like like, like Absolutely. But that's our sanctification. That's something that God does once He saved us. He goes to work on us. He loves us where we were. He doesn't leave us where we, where we were. He goes on working in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. But ladies and gentlemen, your sanctification is not the basis of your justification. Big words I know. But it means this, what you do, your ongoing Christian life is not what saves you. What saves you is the life and death of Jesus Christ plus nothing. Amen. And that's why when I visit someone on a deathbed, I don't bring up their giving record, whether they're church members, whether they are this, whether they've done that. I say, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Is that the one you're trusting in? And hopefully the answer is yes. And I can come with assurance he who calls upon the name of the Lord 
has an 18% chance of being saved, but it's a very flimsy salvation, you understand. It's more like probation. Yeah, you're out of prison, but I'm watching you. Is that what your Bible says? No. Therefore, look at Romans 5.1. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ.